Welcome everybody to the uh, iHydrant uh, Remote Water Pressure and Temperature Monitoring uh, webinar. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, so I, I, my name is Tom Bohr. I'm Vice President of iHydrant. Uh, the format today is uh, we're, we're lucky to have uh, a couple people talking to you from utilities. Uh, Josh Wedding is from Redmond, Oregon. He runs that water utility up there. He's going to talk to you just about some of the experiences with pressure monitoring. Uh, and what he's uh, done with the remote pressure monitoring and captured and that sort of thing. Uh, and we also have Shannon Rodriguez, uh, who's product manager at Nighthawk iHydrant. Um, and she's gonna, her unique perspective is she spent quite a few years with the city of Houston as man managing engineer. Uh, so she's gonna bring her perspective. Uh, I will uh, uh, be answering some Q and A questions online. Uh, so I'll be handling the Q and A you have options to ask the panelists uh, questions, which we'll be getting to. Uh, there is two options for getting questions to us. Uh, one is in the chat forum. Uh, Mark Hewelson will be covering the chat forum, so he'll answer any questions you have through that. Uh, there's also a Q&A button from the Zoom, and those questions are, are questions that will come to me, and some of them will be answered by uh, uh, both Shannon or Josh. Um, so without... Um, Further ado, I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, to Shannon and Josh so that they can um, uh, introduce themselves and be, kind of begin their back and forth. Thanks, Tom. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself and give you a little bit of, of my background, uh, and then Josh will do the same. Um, as Tom mentioned, I was with the city of Houston uh, prior to my current job. I've been in the water industry for about 15 years, though. Mm -hmm. And I am by trade a licensed civil engineer. Um, I'm actually licensed in four different states. Uh, I spent the first eight years of my career as a design consultant, uh, working with utilities to develop their hydraulic models and their master plans, and also design full-scale water, wastewater, and reuse networks, water reuse. I then moved over to the public sector from being a design consultant and started working with the city of Houston in the planning and development services group where I manage the hydraulic model and master planning and uh, large scale planning for the city drinking water system. And after two years of doing that, I transitioned up into drinking water operations where I finished as a managing engineer and worked there for five years with an amazing team that managed everything from large diameter transmission programs to water quality and pressure management, uh, source water protection, safety, transmission and distribution, and emergency response planning. So it was a little bit of everything outside of the fence lines uh, pertaining to the drinking water system. Um, after five years with the city, or after seven years with the city, I transitioned over to work for the iHydrant team where I am now the water product manager. And um, one of the reasons for that is during my time in working with Houston, I was continuously looking for technologies to deploy out in the field that were at a, a good price point and we, we wouldn't have to be concerned about them being damaged or stolen, uh, shot, spray painted, anything that you don't want to put an expensive technology out in the field. So I came over to this side of the industry to work with a team that helps me develop these new products from a utility perspective and what I would see as beneficial. Um, so I really look towards technology and products that assist with operational optimization and definitely strategic deployment depending on the characteristics of each unique drinking water system. So that's a little bit about me. Um, Again, Josh Redmond or Josh Wedding is with the city of Redmond. And Josh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. My background is a little bit shorter than yours. <clears throat> I'm Josh Wedding. I'm a water utilities manager here for the city of Redmond. Uh, been in water for about 25 years, 10 years in the private industry, and then the last 15 here for the city. And um, I'm here to uh, give a firsthand account of how we use the pressure sensors here in the field and hopefully answer any of your guys' questions. Awesome, thanks Josh. So one of the first questions I have for you, uh, as you are looking at doing advanced pressure monitoring in your drinking water system, and more specifically utilizing things in your system such as hydrants or valves, what were the benefits you were expecting and looking for when uh, identifying technologies? Sure, so we've we piloted a couple of different, uh, <clears throat> different sensors early before you guys, and a lot of them required cutting the road, tapping the main, and putting a pressure sensor in a box below ground. And so that's not always conducive. Um, and the, the data we got from those sensors wasn't the best. 
And so we were looking, you know, for different ways, how we could leverage the existing infrastructure in the distribution system, um, low cost, low maintenance, low install, easy install, I should say. Um, and uh, your guys' pressure sensor stuck out because we could utilize the existing hydrants. A um, few other pressure sensors we could have used on, on the hydrants, but uh, that would require flooding the hydrant, keeping it flooded. And that's not conducive for the environment that we have up here. We get pretty cold in the wintertime. And so uh, when we looked at you guys, you guys kind of met all the criteria uh, for sensors that would work in our system. So you talked about the excitement or the, the ease of installation with it being coupled with existing hydrants um, or even with the installation of new hydrants. How, how do you feel that goes with the uh, actual operation of the hydrant? Does it impact it? Have you had any issues with the fire department? What are your thoughts pertaining to that? No, in fact, uh, of course, going forward with these, the first thing we did was had a meeting with the fire department. We installed, uh, we had three original ones that were in the ground, met with the fire department, you know, went to uh, went to all three of the sensors. You know, showed the fire department what they were, how it operated. You know, it doesn't doesn't impact the fire hydrant operation at all. And so we got the blessing from the fire department, and then proceeded forward from there. Um, in terms of installation, of course, you know, buying a brand new one from the dealer, that's pretty easy, right? Then the developer just goes ahead and puts it in. Um, when it comes to retrofits, you know, taking some of the hydrants that are in the system and retrofitting with your guys' pressure sensors, our hydrant team is pretty good. Bobby can get one done in about. 45 minutes. Awesome. So on the on the data side of things, what has been, in your opinion, the most beneficial aspect of having the real-time pressure monitoring data? The most beneficial, huh? Well, there's <laughs> there's there's numerous benefits. Like I've said before, there's data that we see that I don't really want to see. <laughs> it's it's good, it's good to see that. It's good to understand what's going on in your distribution system. Um, but for us, the most beneficial would be pressure transients, by far. Excellent. Um, so with, uh, when, with using these devices to identify those transients, have you been able to improve your system operations and operational strategies to t try to mitigate these transients that you're capturing? Oh yeah, you betcha. You. Um, I've got a I've got a number of different situations where we've used it. Um, I'll bring up the latest one. <clears throat> so uh, Wednesday we had a power outage, big power outage, took out 900 homes up on the hill, and so we have a pressure zone that's a hydromatic system, right? It's a closed zone, no gravity tanks floated. Period. It's all all the pressure is provided by booster pumps, and so any any hitch in those pumps create serious issues for us, and. Um, we installed one of your guys' pressure sensors at the top of our high pressure zone. And so to give you an idea, the booster station sits at an elevation of about 3,000 feet and the top of the hills at about 3,280. And so those booster pumps are always, always maintaining pressure at the top of the hill. Um, before your guys' pressure sensor, we were only able to monitor pressure at the booster station. So of course, you've got about 180 feet of elevation back down to that. Um, so like I said, any hitch in those pumps creates serious pressure issues on top of the hill, most of which we were never really aware of until the phone rang, you know, when you get customer calls. And so anyways, um, we were having issues on top of the hill, I mean, for the last year, year and a half, and we noticed it because of your guys' pressure sensor. So that caused us to look inwardly, and in regards to the booster pump station, you know, what could we do to tighten things up there, you know? Um, how could we how could we make those pumps transfer uh, more efficiently, faster, um, and also you know so if in a situation like this where we lose power, um, adjusting the gen set and the transfer switch to engage that pump station a lot sooner, right? So we made all these changes with our uh, our third party SCADA provider, and uh, you know we hadn't tested it yet, didn't get the chance to test it. We just hoped that everything worked. So on Wednesday when we lost power on the hill. The gen set came on. It transferred as fast as we, we could make it transfer. Usually there's about, you know, if anybody's familiar with gen sets and, and transfer switches, uh, generally there's a lag time of about 15 to 20 seconds before that transfer switch switches over. Um, and we, we tighten that up the best we could, as tight as we could get it. And so during this power outage, the booster pumps died, the gen set came on, engaged the next booster pump in line so fast 
that according to your guys' pressure sens sensor on top of the hill, we only lost about two PSI. That's how quick, that's how tight we got the booster pump station. And so that pressure sensor on top of the hill, we used to make most of these changes at the booster pump station. Um, that's probably, that is, that, that pressure sensor in town is probably our best pressure sensor. Awesome. So we talked, that's one definite operational uh, change that y'all are able to identify. Um, I know in the past, and I think it's, it's happened a couple of times, you've had the operation of an altitude valve um, that's been operated the same way for many years um, cause surging throughout the system. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you bet. So uh, we have, uh, well, this is two of the original ones we put in. Um, all the way on the north end of town. So the north end of town is complete gravity fed uh, from the system tank that sits on the hill at the south end of town. And we've got a pressure sensor on either side of a dry canyon. So we've got a, a big dry canyon that bisects town here. And uh, so we put them in and, uh, you know, started watching the data after a couple of days. <clears throat> and at the same time every day, we kept seeing this large pressure spike on, on actually both of the hydrants, which was odd, right? And uh, you know, you look at it for a while, and of course, the first thing you always think is, oh man, these sensors are screwed up, right? It's like looking at your GPS when you're in the woods. You don't trust it, even though it's right. And uh, so after we figured out that it was right, and it kept continuing to happen, you know, you, you start to look at, uh, you know, what's causing this? Is it, uh, is, it, is it a contractor that's stealing water from a hydrant every day at the same time? Um, you know, what, what event could be happening? Well, it was, it was so... It, I guess it was so, oh, what's the word? It was so consistent that we figured out that it had to be an automated process, right? And so then you start looking inwardly, you know, is it something that's being caused by us? Is there something else in the system that we don't know about? Some private side of pertinence, like a booster pump, um, you know, something like that. So it took us a couple of weeks, right? <clears throat> and then, uh, Looking at some of our system processes, we realized that uh, we have an altitude valve that fills a large storage reservoir here in the main zone, right? It was, uh, yeah, that, that, uh, that reservoir sits there for fire protection for some of the mills. Anyways, that altitude valve closed down at the same time every day. And it just happened to be when we saw these pressure spikes, right? And so we go visit the vault and take a look at the altitude valve. And it's an 18-inch 18, 18 altitude valve, and that thing generally should close over a, over a few minutes, you know, this altitude valve was closing in about 12 seconds. Uh, and so it was taking that water hammer and sending out into the distribution zone. Um, what, what you can't see from that graph is those two pressure sensors are located about two and a half miles away from the altitude valve. And so that, that surge was going all the way out through the north end of town and affecting, you know, not only the probably the integrity of the pipeline, but uh, possibly some customers as well. And then looking back on some of the complaints that we'd gotten over the, the months before we put these pressure sensors in, the school district has a, a couple of schools out on the north end of town just by one of those pressure sensors. Well, they kept calling us and saying, you know, hey, our T&P valves are blowing on our hot water heaters. Oh, all right, well, you know, you've got something going on on your side of the property because it's not coming from us, right? <laughs> In hindsight, I probably shouldn't have said that, but I mean, in all reality, we, we had no idea that we were causing the issue until we put those pressure sensors in. And so um, that led us back to the, to the altitude valve and putting some maintenance into that, adjusting some speed controls. So not only did it help with operational strategies, it helped on the customer service side of things too, it sounds like. Oh yeah. <laughs> and there were probably a few apologies after that. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so you you managing utility and and uh my municipal background we are both very familiar with the notion of contractors stealing water borrowing water mm -hmm. uh have you been able to identify any instances of that um using the pressure monitors yeah you bet you we have um you know i've spoke to this before so in the main zone the gravity zone um it's a little bit more difficult, right? You can see those, you can see somebody's using water off of a hydrant. And after looking at the data for so long, you know, you understand what, what hydrant use looks like, especially when somebody's, you know, opening a hydrant and shutting it down very rapidly. And so in the main zone, it's a little bit more difficult if we had more, more sensors, 
in, in town, we've got 24 sensors in the ground here. Um, if you had more, you could you, you could narrow that down to you know which hydrant a, uh, a contractor might be using. Um, in the high pressure zone, it's a lot easier to determine where uh, a contractor is using a hydrant. Awesome. So and also, I guess not only just contractor theft or, or not just contractors, any theft of water at a hydrant, um, but just improper operation of that hydrant, uh, whether mm -hmm. it be through routine flushing or the fire department or anything like that um, can be captured by those units. Yep. Um, so, I mean, I, I know I've been talking with you this morning, you're in the midst of planning an emergency shutdown, um, you know, the ever, the ever dreaded maintenance or main break. Um, have you been able to capture any main breaks um, on the devices? Has it improved your response time? Do you feel like you're, it helps you be more proactive in, in uh, mobilizing to get out to these main breaks? Yeah, and so there, we've got a couple of instances. We might have the data and some graphs, but uh, the first one, and this kind of goes back to using the pressure sensor data to adjust your system controls, right? So this goes back to the, uh, the booster pump station on the hill for the high pressure zone. This is about a year ago, maybe a little bit longer. We had a contractor that was working up over the top of the hill and down the other side. So if you can imagine the booster pump station has to send water up over the hill and then down the other side, and it'll go out about a mile, right? So we've got about a mile of distribution out on the other side of the hill. And this contractor was excavating and decided that he wanted to remove a thrust block from the end of one of the caps on a piece of 12 inch. Um, and as soon as he did that, the cap blew off. So this is way out at the end of the high pressure zone. Well, almost immediately, so you have to understand what happens there hydraulically, which you probably do, you're an engineer. You know, you get a big delta in there, right? So you remove all of the pressure from the south side of the hill. And then the top of the hill, of course, wants to flow down to fill that gap. And you end up with a delta in between the pump station and the top of the hill, right? There's a big lag time. And so the top of the hill, <clears throat> I don't know if you guys have the data, but the top of the hill will see pressures that it shouldn't see. Let's just put it that way before the pump station is able to react and, and, and try to try to meet that demand need. And so we saw that based on your pressure sensor, we saw what was happening, you know, possibly in a slight violation with the state on top of the hill. And uh, we had to adjust our booster pumps to meet that demand, I should say, ahead of time, right? So you've got to lie to the booster pump station when it sees that pressure. And so we had to overspeed the pumps so that we wouldn't see low pressure on top of the hill, if that makes sense. Yeah, perfect sense. Um, so that's that's and, interesting to know that the, the monitors are able to capture that so so quickly, <laughs> yeah, even though you they, don't want to know it necessarily. <laughs> they, most times I get, I get alarms from you guys as pressure sensors before I get alarms from our SCADA system. So, um, so anyways, that was an instance where we lost the cap on the end of the 12 inch. Um, and then this summer, guys were working on 18 inch on top of the hill, making some hot taps and some C900 and we got a beam break up on top of the hill. It was pretty bad. I, I've got the video that I could show you guys if I could upload it. I happened to be videoing at the time when it broke. Um, and it actually caused, caused some harm to a couple of the operators that were in the ditch. Um, but also we were able, able to capture that data with the pressure sensor. Nothing we could have done about that, obviously. Um, it just had, oh yeah, there it is. Uh, <laughs> um, nothing, nothing we could have done in terms of, you know, operational wise on the, on the pump station, but it was there to capture the data. That's, that's a pretty substantial leak you've got. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't a good one. Yeah. Um. Well, so I'm going to talk a little bit, about, Josh, I'm going to transfer over to some of my experiences um, and some of what utilities I'm working with right now have, have found in the field, as well as kind of my motivation and my methodology with using pressure monitoring devices um, when I was in Houston, um, because with a system that size, it's definitely in comparison to Redmond. How, how many miles of pipe does Redmond have? 182. 182 miles versus a city like Houston that has 7,500 miles. Um, so you have to be a little bit more strategic with deployment of pressure monitors um, and definitely kind of what you want to monitor. Um, with our utilities right now, um, what we're seeing a lot of commonly, um, Josh touched on the altitude valve, but we see 
a lot of um, PRVs that have started to slide. Um, within 48 hours of installation, one of our, our customers found um, that the pilot on his PRV was broken. And when they went to isolate to make the repairs, they discovered that the downstream valve was in holding. Um, and he anticipated that it it saved them quite a bit of money in, in getting in and making the repairs before it got much worse um, and before they would have to replace the PRV in, in, in its entirety. Um, again, a lot of PRV valves are seeing settings that they're, they're set to one thing, but what's coming downstream of the, the PRV is not what was set on the on the valve itself. So a lot of utilities are seeing that as an operational strategy um, to QAQC, the PRVs, if you will, to make sure you're getting what you're supposed to out of those valves. Um, a lot, Josh touched on main breaks. One of the, the big things we have heard is, uh, as it being a more proactive approach, uh, several utilities estimate that it's reducing their response time by an hour. I know, and I'm sure Josh will agree that one of the biggest, fail when you feel like the biggest failure is when your customers are calling you, telling you about a main break that you don't know in your system versus you seeing it through remote monitoring or the SCADA system uh, to be you know, able to get out there and make that repair uh, faster and more efficiently to reduce that, that non-revenue water that's being poured out onto the street. Uh, so partially closed or throttled valve, that was a big one um, with me down in Houston. We had a lot of large diameter lines that we couldn't always figure out why we were seeing transients or why there were we were getting pressure complaints. Um, we were able to identify throttled valves, um, valves that had been sheared off and stuck in a closed position. Uh, customers that were actually bad actors, customers that were taking more than their contractually, you know, agreed upon amount of water, which was causing pressure drops, impacting other contract customers in the city. Um, so strategically placing those monitors along those critical large diameter pipelines was a good way to really identify um, what some of those issues were and where some of the hydraulic pinch points were, you know, those throttled valves. Maybe we had piecemeal pipe together where we went from a 16 to a 10 to a 16 and it was causing pressure reductions um, before getting the water down to the customer's meters. Um, another good one's remote areas. Like Josh said, they had the cap blow off at the end of the pressure zone. Uh, we had one instance where we had a hydrant leaking in the woods that we had no idea about. It was causing substantial amounts of damage um, to properties once the water got to that point because it was leaking so terribly. Um, so being able to remote those areas that aren't highly trafficked by other pedestrians or um, by vehicles so you can actually see if there's a leak that you're unaware of to reduce that water loss uh, in your system. Um, another big one's critical customers. Uh, cities like Houston and uh, even mid-sized cities have hospitals, uh, especially right now with, with this current state that we're in. Um, hospitals, dialysis clinics, large contractual customers that can quickly turn their systems over to bottle water or can water in the event of a natural disaster, an earthquake, a hurricane, um, a forest fire, to make sure that they, they're maintaining pressure to produce water to effectively respond to the event that's occurring. Um, and like I said, the medical centers, Texas has one of the largest med centers in the, in the nation. So you always wanna make sure that they stay in pressure um, so they can obviously handle their customers and, and take care of their customers the way they should be able to. Another big one for me was emergency response planning. So coupling that with master planning and model calibration and the hydraulic model. Um, I came from the land of hurricanes. I've been through many floods down in Houston and I come up to earthquakes and forest fires, which is totally new to me. Um, but in the same, it's same effect, it's a similar response. Um, something happens, you may not be able to get out to certain parts of your, your system, the remote areas, if you have a bridge go down, if you have a fire. So having units in the field, you can just look at your desktop from the safety of your office or your home, see that data and, and run the system um, from your, uh, from like I said, a safe space. Um, a lot of systems are looking at the, the possibility of coupling it into their ERPs and RRAs, um, emergency response plans and risk and resiliency assessments that the EPA is requiring to demonstrate that it is making the system more resilient. And then there's federal funding available to apply for where utilities are looking to try to use that funding to buy some of this technology. As I said, it's a form of making it more resilient, making your system more resilient. Um, and then what are the other what other big items um, coupled with you know these these large scale events? Um, 
are, are things that result after how you how you want to respond to those if you have numerous large diameter main breaks you have to be able to prioritize and monitor the whole system and especially if one comes to mind and folks from Houston that might be on remember the 66 that shut down that was three days of no sleep half a city out of water but we were able to use the pressure monitoring data that we collected coupled with um, emergency water quality testing to demonstrate that we were maintaining pressures in some areas, we were maintaining residual in some areas, we were able to reduce the boundaries of the boil water notice zone. And then as the pipeline came back into service, we, we showed them additional data and were able to have boil water notice lifted um, within 24 hours. So that was a huge win. And that's something that a lot of the large, large utilities and small utilities alike, no utility wants to issue a boil water notice. So it's really how to strategize and use the data that you're getting from these devices to be able to respond to all the vast scenarios that could possibly occur. Um, so that's just my perspective. I don't know if you have anything else on the hydraulic side you want to add, Josh, uh, things you've seen or benefits. Yeah, we actually just used them with our third party. Uh, we've got an engineering firm that's doing a water model for us um, on top of the hill. and. Uh, we were able to provide the data from you guys' pressure sensor coupled with you know, the data from uh, the wells and the pumps, as well as a diurnal demand on the meters. <clears throat> and they use that data to figure out you know, where, our, where our hydraulic pinch points were. Um, we're gonna actually embarking on a huge project here with a new, another system reservoir, a huge booster pump station, and another well. Uh, for you guys that don't know, we're all groundwater here. Um, big deep wells, uh, no surface water. And so when we're pushing water out of those wells, we push them to system reservoirs up at the, the highest point of town here. Um, the new system reservoir <clears throat> um, in modeling where we were gonna put that, we were able to locate a couple of hydraulic pinch points leading up to that and of course out of that. Uh, one of your guys' pressure sensors we actually installed right in that area. So. Uh, from an operator standpoint, we had a, a, a basic understanding of where the pinch point was, but uh, with your guys' pressure sensors, we were able to really narrow that down. And so the, uh, the engineering firm used the data from your guys' pressure sensors and incorporated into the, uh, the model. It was very helpful. So that's actually a great segue to my next question for you. Um, you currently have devices strategically located um, in your drinking water system but could potentially expand. Um, like you said, you have 24 right now, but if you had more in the system, you could pinpoint some of these um, a little more closely. Um, what, was, what does expansion look like for Redmond and what would you recommend to other utilities uh, looking to deploy a master plan with pressure monitoring um, and how would they, what vehicles could they use to get those uh, pressure devices in, uh, implemented? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, like I said before, not not every utility is the same, of course, right? We've got we've got different infrastructure in the ground. We've got different topography to deal with, different pressure zones to deal with. Um, and so, I guess uh, I'll I'll give an example of what we chose to do here. Um, like I said, each each utility is probably different. Um, Redmond's fairly flat. We have uh, um, the topography from the south end of town to the north end of town, of course, goes downhill. And so, when it comes to um, deploying pressure sensors out in the field. You know, we looked at it, all of us got together and looked at the entire distribution system. And you've got a pretty basic understanding, like I said, as an operator and, and uh, where you want to deploy those. And so, like I said, the high pressure side, um, north end of town, hydraulic pinch points, all the areas that we that we knew, right? Obviously we wanted to put it in a spot where we'd get data and we'd get actionable data, right? Good data that we could we could act on. And then going forward, you know, looking to expand, we wrote, uh, we wrote the pressure sensors into our standards and specs. And we sat down, we, we tried to figure out what would be good spacing for the pressure sensors without being completely redundant, right? And so the way that we wrote our specs up was, you know, every subdivision that goes in or every 50 houses, that gives us pretty decent spacing on the hydrants. Um, and the data that we get out of those is beneficial, especially down the road. Well, that's definitely a way instead of having to, when it comes to budget planning time, which I know is, is dreaded for most utilities, instead of having to put it in y'all's capital budget, it can actually be incorporated through capital improvement projects or development projects where they're paying SDCs and things like that. Um, you touched on the fact, you know, that 
an engineering firm is currently working with y'all. Um, I know most states require every five years a uh, water master plan uh, be updated coupled with the hydraulic model. Um, and you were able to provide the data to the engineering firm to use to calibrate the model. Um, I guess, uh, for my opinion, uh, in the past, it also wouldn't be a bad way to purchase the technology, just like you have it built into specs for development, the potential to use the technical contracts that are already improved, approved and already in place um, to be able to purchase technology coupled with use for the, the hydraulic model and the master plan, and then would be grandfathered over to y'all to keep once that the project is done. Is that something y'all would ever consider? Yeah, you betcha. Awesome. So you talked a little bit earlier um, about installation of the product. Mm -hmm. um, just to get everybody a little background on our specific pressure product, uh, there are two current options, um, which we mentioned. There's the retrofit kit, which uh, you can use on existing hydrants. And then there's the complete assembly where it comes with the new hydrant, which is more along the lines of what Josh's utility would see with developers putting in um, a pressure monitor every 50 houses or every new development. Um, that you would get straight from your, your distributor. Uh, explain your thoughts on the initial installation process uh, for the retrofit kits. Like I should just clarify, all of y'all's are retrofit kits currently. Um, and so your thoughts on the in initial installation process, but also the support that our team, you know, being on site, software training, things like that. Um, just kind of your thoughts on that full initial uh, get go with uh, the pressure monitors. Mm -hmm. Sure. The first two, you know, a couple of years ago when we first put them in, I think it was a learning experience for all of us, you know, my crew and your team, putting them in, trying to figure out, you know, what works best, what doesn't work, you know, what needs to be changed. And uh, when you guys came back out a couple of months ago to do the, uh, the additional 20, it was definitely streamlined, a lot easier, crew understood what needed to be done. Um, I will say that uh, from an operator standpoint, when they're dealing with you guys, Make sure your operators get correct buried depths. That's that's huge. You know, give give good data to the people that are, you know, manufacturing the product for you. Um, in fact, there was a lot of hydrants that we actually took the bonnets off, you know, and taped it out to make sure that it was the correct bearing, just so we got the the right product. But yeah, it was pretty pretty easy once we got the hang of it. Awesome. So. Right now, I know, and I already asked you um, about the potential to expand the monitoring system. Would you consider the inclusion of leak detection in the existing system and any future expansions with pressure monitoring, temperature monitoring that you currently do? Yeah, you betcha. We'd love to see that. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the uh, the whole purpose of leak detection is well, to find leaks, right? But for us, what it, what it also might do is it might shift your you know, your capital maintenance. Uh, we focus a lot on the old steel, which we should. Uh, the old steel here in town is pretty bad. <clears throat> um, but what we what we used to do and what we still tend to do is group pipe replacement based on age. Um, and so with leak detection in the ground, that might shift our thought process slightly. You know, we might find some some pipe class that's a, that's a later year, right? Might be in the 70s it's leaking and uh, might shift our focus to maybe start replacing some of that pipe and not just replace the pipe that's old based on year. That would be the main, the main focus for us. Awesome. So I have one final question for you um, before we jump over to our Q&A. Uh, you get a lot of data. You have a, a, you know, a website where you can access the data. Um, you come in and start managing the utility a few years ago. Um, been there 15 years. Uh, did you see any resistance from employees that have been there for many years? Um, the ones I like to call the oracles that are have so much wonderful inherent knowledge, but introducing this form of technology uh, may not, you know, be widely accepted initially. Uh, did you see any of that in the utility? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Of course, you've you've. <laughs> I've got a couple of them that have been here a long, long time, and they know the system inside and out, right? And uh, they can operate a phone pretty well, and you know, that's about it. But they've got a ton of hydraulic knowledge. They, they really do. And so when you're introducing new technology, it's like, well, why do we got to put this in here? I know exactly what the pressures are. <clears throat> and I understand that. I mean, obviously, 
Most of us worked in water a long time, so you can look at a distribution system and know pretty much right off the bat what the static water pressure should be. Um, but once we installed these units, and then you start to see the data that comes out of them, especially the, uh, I don't want to call it bad data, it's just data that you don't want to see, you know, in your distribution system. Uh, we'll call it actionable data, that's a good word. Um, <laughs> You know, once you start to see some of those, I mean, if you're a true operator and you start to see that, it's like, oh, hey, wow, this is pretty neat, you know? And so for those so-called oracles, then they take that data and then they get, you know, they get excited because they're able to go into the field and try to figure out what's going on, right? That's where the fun comes in. Um, and it's also, we use it from a customer service standpoint as well, right? So, you know, kind of going off your your oracle question you know we get a lot of people that call hey you know i've got a, a pressure problem and uh, we're in the process of putting all these pressure sensors on our online interactive map right so you can go in as a customer access your online interactive map and you can see everything about the water system that you want to see including pressures and so we always direct them you know hey you've got a pressure sensor you know two blocks down from your house here's what your street pressure is right now uh, that's been very, very beneficial for us. That's lowered the amount of phone calls that have come into CIS. Um, it's lo lowered the amount of phone calls that come into us. Well, awesome. Thank you for answering my questions. I think, uh, like I said, we're now going to switch over to answer some questions that we have received from uh, some of the folks that have been watching. Um, so, Tom, I don't know if you want to jump in and lead our Q&A session. Uh, sure, Shane. I got quite a few questions here queued up. Um, first uh, is about, uh, can you talk to any stories or how does this operate with uh, PRV valves? So with, with how, and, and Josh can probably chime in on this too. So what we've seen with some customers is having them uh, upstream and downstream in close proximity um, because you obviously you, you set your pressures for what if it's a one-way PRV for what you are having come out of the downstream um, just to kind of cross check and like Josh said you know there were they had the altitude valve that was spiking the same time every day there was some consistent hydraulic data coming out of the pressure monitors close to the PRVs where we had them come back and say okay that the pressure spike is actual is actually real the prv was not functioning the way it should and the pressure monitor downstream just happened to be catching that catching the surge in the system um so that's really how we've seen customers use them josh i don't know if you have any input on how you would couple it with um any control valves or prvs i would i would install them close to the valve the control valve you know not too close but not too far away right you want to be close enough to, to catch any any type of hydraulic condition before it gets gets too far out there. Um, you know, on the PRVs, that's pretty nice. Um, you're able to tell if your speed controls are out of whack, you know, if you got something wrong internally, um, and you'll know it pretty quick too. Control valves, um, I, I'd say that they're probably more beneficial paired with a PRV than they would be a control valve. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, just a couple of a few questions about just talking more about the uh, mechanical design of the device and how it uh, how it works. Um, and uh, I guess we'll start there. So, okay. So just an overall overview of the installation, what it what it entails, the dry barrel unit itself. Correct. Okay. So uh, as Josh and I kind of talked about. Um, he has all dry barrels, um, obviously in a, a cold weather climate, you want a dry barrel uh, unit where you're like, or you're going to freeze. Um, so with the retrofit kits, what it is, is a complete uh, reinstallation of the guts of the hydrant, as we call it. So you have your lower valve plate, uh, where you have your pressure and temperature center sensor in the lower valve plate. So they're actually in the water. And then you have your wiring and tubing that runs up along the stem. Uh, you have a six inch spool, so it'll actually make your, your hydrant about six inches taller. And that's where, you hear, that's a good picture. The red is on the right is the dry barrel hydrant. So that six inch spool uh, is where all of the electronics are housed. So the board, the battery, um, all of the communication board, uh, it is run on cellular. And then there's a security shield that goes around it with six, six security screws. So one of the, the big mechanical benefits to this is you don't have to charge the hydrant. You don't have to put water in the hydrant. Whereas if you use a cap version, 
other pressure monitor monitoring device, which I've used several of in my past, and I know Josh has as well, you have to charge the hydrant, which causes wear and tear on the hydrant. It could impede um, use of it by the fire department, uh, and it can also cause issues if you are in a, a freezing climate. Um, so it's definitely uh, a nice feature to not impact the, me the mechanical operation of the hydrant itself. Uh, there are new kits available, which it's the entire hydrant uh, that I talked about a little bit that comes with everything already pre-installed and you would install it just as you would a new hydrant. Everything's already in place. You would activate the, the uh, pressure and temperature device and it would function just like it would a normal hydrant. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and can you talk more about, you know, obviously that's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's both a retrofit and a new hydrant. Uh, you're, you're able to get it either way. Can you talk about the benefits of getting, getting it as a new hydrant? So the benefits of getting as a new hydrant, um, obviously, as we mentioned, it, it comes directly from distribution. It's already put together. Um, you don't have to worry about dismantling an older hydrant, um, especially if, if the hydrant's aged at all. Um, it's just, like I said, it's a very simple installation, just like you would a normal hydrant. Um, and what Josh is doing with incorporating it into the specs and developer contracts, they would be ordering them new. Um, so it, it just simplifies the process a little bit more. Um, if you get a, a brand new hydrant and install it that way versus a retrofit kit, but they're both as far as the data and what you receive on the technical side of things are mutually beneficial. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go to the next question here. Um, talk about uh, the data sampling rate and where you're at and where, where you're going with that and just kind of how that works. Okay. Yeah, so our current sampling rate, um, our standard is a sample every five seconds, a threshold of 15 minutes, and a data upload every 12 hours. So with the 15-minute the threshold, what that is is it takes the sample every five seconds, and in that 15-minute window, it averages all of those samples, provides you your average data point, but it also gives you your threshold, your min and max, so what those pressures you saw in that 15-minute window were. And that is our standard setting on our, our current unit. Uh, if you have pressure alarms sent, uh, when you, let me back up a little bit. So you can set thresholds on these devices, your minimum and maximum pressure, your transient threshold, and then your minimum and, max, minimum and maximum temperature. So when you set alarms on those, and anytime a sample exceeds those thresholds, it'll go under what we call rapid sampling uh, mode. So it'll go for 30 seconds, taking up to 50 samples per second, and then calm down and then it'll 30 minutes later it'll fire back up to see if you're still in exceeding that threshold and if you do have those alarms enabled you'll receive an alarm within two minutes telling you that your thresholds have been exceeded so that's one of the comments josh made a lot of times he gets notified by our alarm system before his SCADA system ever tells him so it's a bit a, a very fast response time when those thresholds are exceeded um, when you do have alarming enabled on any of the units. Uh, where we're looking to go, we are in development of a more rapid sampling device um, that can do in the range of up to 256 samples per second, but our current one is what I stated, the sample every five seconds um, with a 15 minute threshold. Okay, and, and all that's done with a, a battery operated and, and what's, your, uh, what's the battery life on a standard sampling uh, unit? Right, so it is It is uh, battery operated. It is two D lithium batteries. Um, they're pretty common in our industry. Uh, with the standard sampling rate that I mentioned, the uh, sample every five seconds, 15 minutes, upload every 12 hours, uh, the battery life is five years. Um, it's very easy to replace. Josh could actually talk to that because he's done quite a few battery replacements um, with taking the, you know, taking the security shields off on the dry barrel units, unplugging the old battery, plugging the new one in and putting the shield back on. Um, Josh, I don't know if you have any comments about battery replacement. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple. Like you said, just take the shield off, pop the batteries off, put the new batteries on, and you're good to go. And the batteries that we've been replacing are just different as you guys have upgraded your batteries, just putting new ones in, so you get new ones. Okay. Um, got lots of questions, so I'll just keep going here until our time comes <laughs> um, Hopefully I get to most of them, but uh, <laughs> um, can you talk about um, how the data is, so 
you get this data, it's in a web-based system, uh, you get your alerts via text or email, that sort of thing. But you know, you want to use the data mm -hmm. for more as a utility. Uh, how do you, you know, how how can you get it to Excel? Are there multiple ways to do that, or how can you get it into your your SCADA system data or your other software systems? What are your options for that, or what do you have planned for that? That sort of thing. Okay, so um, as you mentioned, the the data does go into a web host web, web a web hosted software right now, um, which is available on mobile devices and all desktops. Um, so it is easy to use in the field. Uh, within the software itself, there are many places where you can export the data yourself to CSV to an Excel file for use for analysis. Um, there's also reporting features. Uh, an alternative method, if a utility is looking to put it into the SCADA system, um, we can provide the data via CSV flat file um, on a secured FTP site, where then we work with the utility on formatting for what they exactly need in that CSV file. They can, they provide the FTP site, the secure site. We upload the file every 12 hours, as would the units uploading the data. So every time there's new data, and then they can go take that file and incorporate it into the SCADA system. Now the new alternative, which is currently in development with us is, is providing the data to utilities uh, via API. So they can directly uh, and more securely utilize the data and, and uh, import the data into the SCADA system for use with pressures you're seeing from your various facilities um, and, and throughout the system. Um, I know Josh mentioned that they're actually putting their pressure monitors on their interactive map um, using the data so they can have, see it all coupled with their uh, their water lines um, and hydrants. Okay. Um, there was a question about, so, so, uh, I think Josh mentioned, maybe it was you, Shannon, uh, about uh, funding for this type of thing, um, whether it be as a new hydrant or as a retrofit. Can you just talk about where municipalities can look for uh, for the funding that you guys mentioned? I'm not sure who definitely <laughs> no that was definitely me um, as part of emergency response planning uh, and it could be for new or retrofits um, <clears throat> one of the things like I said that the utilities are looking to do to, to demonstrate resilience uh, in the systems is, is a master plan of pressure monitoring uh, deployed throughout the system a smart water system if you will so you can remotely monitor those areas that I mentioned that you may not be able to get to um, I know Everybody down south can can remember having to deal with eight feet of water on top of valves, and there's no valve key long enough that that can function to uh, to actually close or operate those critical valves or valves you need to isolate um, main breaks. So with that being said, um, FEMA has there's FEMA brick funding available um, currently, and I know there's a lot of other grant programs um, that I could definitely pull information together on, but they're looking to help utilities make their systems resilient, formulate better emergency response plans, reduce that emergency response time, um, how, how utilities are handling the event, how they're responding to the event, and how they recover from the event. Um, so there's a lot of avenues out there. Um, definitely FEMA BRIC is one, like I mentioned. Um, we've talked about that quite a bit, but to put that out there, there's, there's quite a bit of money available, um, and technology is just one of those avenues that, that they're allowing uh, use of the funding for. What about um, about hydrant specifications? So um, um, utilities who specify an I hydrant, what are the benefits for a utility when they do that? So I, I'll talk to this a little bit, then I'll let Josh jump in. Um, from my perspective, it was definitely working with utility or working for a utility. If you can build it into the specs and it's on an approved product list and you have it specified like Josh has it every 50 houses or every new development, um, some utilities may do it every 20 hydrants, every 40 hydrants, depending on their deployment um, schematic. It puts the cost more on the contractor or the developers than it does definitely the utility because going through your rolling capital budgets or your, you know, your budgetary planning time that's seven months out from when you actually get your budget approved and can start using that funding um, can be a little cantankerous and then procurement takes forever. Um, I can hear the, the chuckles. It's, it's a nightmare sometimes trying to get that technology when you're doing it from, from inside the utility. So having it built in the spec and having someone else, a contractor or a consultant, if you have it through a technical contract, uh, makes it a lot 
faster and smoother and simpler because it's already approved by the utility. It's already specified. It's already in the contract and you can get it a lot more quickly and utilize the techno technology a lot more quickly, especially with how rapidly technology is changing and can become obsolete. Um, Josh, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about how it benefits y'all on the spec side um, by having it built in. Well, yeah, the spec side's huge, of course, right? Because it, as you know, that uh, we we're able to avoid all the headache that comes with trying to procure those things from inter, you know inside. And so, written into the specs also helps that uh, that pressure sensor goes in hydrants that we've approved already, right? And so that's uh, that's one of the big uh, I should say uh, the big factors is the uh, the hydrant being approved and then the pressure sensor not affecting operation of that hydrant, right? Um, and then uh, going forward, you know, all we do is maintain them, right? The maintenance of it, you know, on the back end cost of it is is really minimal. My guys spend more money on tools in a day than maintaining those pressure sensors. So um, I, I noticed somebody had asked a question about uh, how do we get the uh, spacing in like the uh, industrial districts and downtown business districts, right? Um, so for us here, Redmond's, like I said, not every utility is the same. Uh, Redmond is about... <laughs> 80% residential, so our industrial and business districts are, are very, very small in comparison to the rest of the rest of the town. And so downtown, we chose to just kind of take that on ourselves. Um, we understand how it grows. We know where hydraulic issues could arise and where they might might already be. And so we just choose to retrofit the ones we want downtown. So um, to answer that question, we don't we don't have that built into our spec for industrial and commercial yet. If we were a large utility like Houston, you know, yeah, probably would have that built in. Great, thanks. Um, let me ask you about, um, let's see, I got lots of questions. So, <laughs> um, oh, talk a little bit, uh, you touched on the data exports, but what about, uh, you know, I just want to get data to Excel. How does, you know, is there ways to do that through the, uh, the website? Yeah, so I actually mentioned that when I when I was discussing uh, the flat files and the, the um, API. So there are several places um, in the software itself for the units where you can export the data directly into a CSV file into an Excel file. Um, there's a there's a main section within our report section in the software, but then also on the individual devices pages. Um, so the user can log into their unique dashboard and export the data themselves if an event happened. I know I used to do it quite a bit um, on my desktop computer and just be able to, to get that data out immediately and graph it myself and, and finagle it and interpret it the way I needed to. Um, so yes, you can do that within the software. Okay, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see here. Um, oh, uh, the battery, um, a lot of, um, I, I come from the AMI industry and, and batteries were always an issue um, and, and even the reporting out on batteries. Uh, talk to me about, you know, is there alerts on low batteries? Are there reports on that? Uh, how do you guys handle that? Yeah, so actually um, there are alerts you can set for low batteries. Um, you, you can also set your threshold. Uh, we have, uh, we typically recommend uh, a threshold, but you can set your threshold to receive those alerts. So that way you don't just have a device disappear. You don't just lose a battery. Um, it gives you enough time to be able to deploy someone to go out there and replace that battery. As we mentioned, the, the batteries are, are easy to replace. Um, they, uh, they're very common in the industry. So they're not hard to come by um, as far as procuring them. Um, but there are, we do show places within the software as well that shows you your current battery level, even if it's not within um, or if it's not below the threshold. So you can constantly get it and see what voltage your battery is at uh, to monitor it yourself. And then you'll obviously, like I said, get an alarm if you have your, your threshold set, your alarm set that says, hey, this battery is getting low. You need to start keeping an eye on it because you're going to need to replace it soon. Um, what, um, let's see, what other questions do I have here? Um, oh, what, what, what hydrants are you compatible with uh, today? So, so right now we are, we are compatible with the McWayne family hydrants. So Kennedy, m and and Clow um, are currently the, the hydrants that can be retrofitted and also come with um, a device as a new hydrant. 
Okay. Uh, talking more about leak detection, um, how would that work with the pressure unit? And is that something that uh, iHydrant is coming out with? Just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and Josh can jump in too on this. So how it would work mechanically? Um, I don't have a cutout picture. I don't know if you have one, Tom, of, of what the inside of the dry barrel unit looks like. But with our technology on the inside, it only takes up half of that big six inch spool and shell. So there's a lot of available room in that housing for things such as leak detection or other future technologies that I'm looking to develop, the, the fun stuff, the geeky stuff I talked about in the beginning. Um, so we looked at ways that we can utilize that open space and we're currently actually pilot, like, piloting um, acoustic leak detection here in Redmond. Um, we have 20 units out uh, and they just, and you take off, oh, there you go, Josh has half a shield. Um, that's the security shield that I mentioned that, that goes around that six inch spool, but it, uh, oh, there we go. There's a cutaway. So that whole side is empty, empty that you're looking at. So the leak detection device that we are, um, piloting right now fits right in that empty space. It, it has two contacts that need a good clear contact with the metal spool. And then you just put the, the how it just sits right in. It doesn't have to connect to anything. It has its own two, uh, lithium batteries in the unit and you just put the other side of the shield back on, screw it up, and it, it stays in that housing. Um, so like I mentioned, we are piloting that. It is acoustic. Um, that we are going to be bringing that to the market here in the near future. Um, and we're also looking at ways for um, hydrophones to actually be in the water within the hydrant, kind of like we have the sensors down in the lower valve plate, so they're in the water. Um, so those utilities that use plastic pipe, HDPE, PVC, can utilize or, or can benefit from leak detection, whereas they wouldn't otherwise by using acoustic. Um, so it's currently where we stand on that, uh, but they will be, be coming out to market here, like I said, in the near future. So we're excited, and it's, it's definitely unique and compatible with our existing uh, pressure monitoring device. Great, great. Um... Uh, one last question before we end, um, but um, uh, just talk about um, uh, from a spacing perspective, uh, both on the pressure units, you know, how far do you recommend or is there, or is there a rule to recommend? Uh, I, I guess I have two questions really. One is that, uh, and then I'll come back with one more. You know, I'm getting lots of questions. <laughs> so I can attack it. And Josh kind of already touched on you know, with Redmond being mostly uh, residential, um, it's, and it's really about, and flat, <laughs> it's covering the, uh, the new developments and definitely the areas where they have critical infrastructure that's aging or serves critical customers. And there's so many different ways to skin a cat. Uh, our general rule of thumb that, that we suggest is about one in every 20 hydrants, which is a lot of coverage, but it really would help a utility correlate and pinpoint more closely where there may be um, a leak or it's especially if it's a, a, a leak that's below ground that's substantial that you know has a conduit carrying it to another location. I have so many stories about mystery leaks um, that we've tried to locate and you, you spend so much time spinning your wheels trying to locate that leak. Um, if, you, if you get units deployed in about every 20 hydrants, you can really get good coverage. Um, and then looking at it, like I said, from my perspective, when you look at a city as large as Houston, you really want to start with uh, critical customers, um, you know, known areas where infrastructure is aging, where you have repetitive main breaks, where your water loss is the highest, where you have those bad actors that take too much water. Uh, def and then and really develop your master plan from there. Um, from my engineering background, the Partnership for Safe Water, one of the things that they always recommend if you want to be a fully optimized system is definitely start with two units per pressure zone or service area and then develop out from there to get to that point where you're about one in every 20 hydrants. And you can really start identifying those hydraulic pinpoints um, where you have water that we would say is short circuiting and just going through the same loop because you have competing pressures between pressure zones. Um, so from my perspective and definitely I hydrants, that's, that's kind of uh, what I would look at is the, the one to 20 is full coverage um, as your, your final master plan. Okay, last question is about uh, hydrant flushing. Can, can the, the system hold up the hydrant flushing when I flush the hydrant, can it, can it stand that? Is it designed to, to stand that uh, and, and everything that goes with that? 
No, 100%. So uh, I know state, I know up here in Oregon, I'm up in Oregon now too, uh, but coming from Texas, the TCEQ requires debt in flushing uh, monthly. So a lot of times it's a blow off valve or a hydrant uh, that's being flushed, or if you've disinfected a pipeline and you're putting it back into service, um, very you know, had water quality event, we're getting red water, things like that. Um, these units are 100% designed for all operation of hydrant. It does not impact the unit. It does not impact the operation of the hydrant itself. Uh, you would operate it just like you would any hydrant. Um, the tubing that, that has the wires along the, the stem of the hydrant is designed for the water flow. Um, we have compression fittings that prevent leakage into the various components where the electronics are housed um, and where the sensors are housed. So 100% these, these withstand um, standard or routine flushing or any other kind of flushing that a utility is required to do. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Shannon, Josh. Uh, great job. Uh, it's good to hear from you. Good to hear from from the utilities. Um, if, if there, I know there was a bunch more questions that were coming through. Uh, I am putting up right now a web. Uh, you can go to our website, um, ihydrant.com. You can go and click there. Cloud Kennedy M and H. You can click there and go get your local sales people. We're happy to come and do presentations on the, the product itself. Um, we didn't get into that as much because we we're just talking about a, uh, uh, applicable uses of it today. Uh, so we're, we're more than happy to come in, uh, especially when we can travel. I hope everyone's staying healthy, uh, meanwhile. Uh, but uh, we can certainly do uh, WebExes for you in the meantime. Uh, but uh, definitely reach out to iHydra.com. Go to, go to your... Uh, hydrant carrier and uh, be happy to answer any questions. So thank you everybody and uh, have a good day.